I'd like to start with a little story. And I have a guy called Lauren Isley to, re to thank for this particular story. Once upon a time, there was a wise man who loved to go out in the morning down to the beach for a walk. So one day he set off as he normally does. And as he neared the beach, he saw this tiny little figure in the distance, dancing away, enjoying whatever it was that was on the beach that was keeping his attention. He thought, that's curious. I don't normally come across people at this time of the morning. Being a curious sort of chap, he hastened his step and off he went to catch up with this little figure on the beach. And as he got nearer and nearer and the figure grew bigger and bigger, he noticed that it was a young man. And he wasn't dancing, but he was just systematically bending down, picking something up. And he went, now this is getting a little bit strange. So he hastened his step again. Practically broke into a run, a bit like the Friday running club that I've heard so much about over the last day or so. He caught up with a young man and he said, young man, he said, do you mind if I ask you, I'm really curious, he said, what on earth are you doing? And he goes, I'm throwing starfish into the sea. And why, might I ask you, man, are you throwing starfish into the sea? And he says, well, he said, the sun's coming out, it's getting hotter, the tide is going out as well, and if I don't throw the starfish into the sea, they will die. <laughs> there are miles and miles of beach, and along every single mile of beach there are lots of starfish. How can you possibly make a difference? And with that, the young man bent down and picked up a starfish, and he threw it gently into the sea. Splash! And he looked the old man square in the face and he said, well, it made a difference to that one, didn't it? Now, my charity, Demand, Demand stands for Design and Manufacture for Disability, works with some wonderful starfish. The starfish that we work with are disabled people. And we do that by designing and making, modifying, adapting, upcycling, re-engineering in some cases, assistive equipment that helps people meet their potential. And this could be anything, by the way, as a charity and the work that we do, we are age ambivalent, we're condition ambivalent, it really doesn't matter. I think our youngest client was probably six weeks old and our oldest well into her 90s. It could be a child in a school. One of our recent projects, for example, was creating a safe haven for a, ch a child with autism in a classroom. We heard from Michael how important it is to actually connect in that classroom. For some children, it's actually really hard to connect. In fact, they don't want to connect at times. So how do you help a child like that achieve their potential and so that they don't disrupt the classroom so that the rest of the class can achieve their potential at the same time. Let me make this real for you. Imagine for a minute that you need 24 by 7 oxygen, supplemental oxygen. Now normally the way that oxygen is delivered to you when you need this kind of thing is in a, a device called an oxygen converter. And an oxygen converter is a unit on casters that's about the size of an R2-D2. Not as entertaining not self-sufficient. You can kind of wheel them around a little bit, but you know, you've got tubes and things that you have to deal with. Now imagine as well that you have some difficulty walking. That's really good. The equipment services, the Red Cross, whoever, have given you a walker. So you've got your two hands occupied, you've got a nice long pipe, and you've got oxygen to deal with at the same time. Now life gets really difficult, doesn't it? So not only do you have to sort of have assistance to walk around, but you've also got to lug a couple of kilos worth of oxygen around with you at exactly the same time. What happens? <clears throat> what happens is this, is that those catch-ups with friends that you used to do and used to go out and most probably do it daily now happen once a week. After a little while, maybe once a month. 
Going out becomes a real fag at this point. It becomes really, really difficult. So you get increasingly lonely because you're in your house a lot. The walls of your house start closing in on you. And you start to lose the connection with the community and the people that you love around you. You need a lot of help to do anything. Now surely, you ask yourselves, in this age of wonderful technological advancement, the gizmos and gadgets, the smartphones, the massive amount of invention, for goodness sake, we put man on the moon, haven't we? And we're now thinking of going to Mars, that there is a solution to this particular problem. Well, possibly there is. But let me introduce you to Sarah. This is Sarah's experience. My name is Sarah Fishman. I'm going to tell you my story because I'm really back in life now. My blood is, hasn't got any oxygen in it. So I need 24 hours oxygen. The only thing is I could not go out of the house. They tried everything. A walker, it tipped over. Another walker, you couldn't fold it. And I nearly really gave up until my daughter looked you up on the internet and found a demand. And they arranged for the gentleman to come. Anyway, he took it away, cut it in half, built the cage, and I can't put the bottle of the oxygen inside. And, um, and I had my freedom again. As you can see, it's a success story. Now, there are an awful lot of Sarahs in the world. It's estimated that in the UK alone, and I'm sorry, but I don't have the figures for Guernsey, but in the UK alone, they reckon that there are about 13 million people who experience disability in some way. On a bigger scale, the World Health Organization figures that there are, there are over 50 million people who actually desperately need a wheelchair, for example, but can't afford one. Now, the social model of disability, and there are two models, by the way, we'll come to the other one in a little while, but the social model of disability asserts that a disability is not caused by an impairment or a difference. It's actually caused by the way that society is organized. And by the way that society is organized, what I actually mean here is, is that the environments that we create, the built environments, the houses, the gizmos and gadgets that we use every single day in our kitchens, the attitudes people have towards people of difference. Now, if you think about it in that particular context, what you'll quickly realize is that disability is something that most probably affects a lot more than the statistics would suggest. Let me just ask you a really, really quick question here. Are there any new mums and dads in the audience? Show of hands. Mm, you want to? How are you getting on with the push chair? Yeah? You ever push one of those around one of those leaders, sort of a very badly designed shop? Or you're trying to get somewhere upstairs in a railway station? That's a really good one. Ever had to wait at the bottom and hopefully there'll be some other fellow traveller that comes along and you say, do you mind? Now, interestingly enough, when you think about it that way, um, it's in all our powers to actually start removing barriers to exclusion, to um, non-participation, and very often to independence. This fellow here doesn't have any of those kinds of problems. I think he's actually found a, a little piece of kit that suits him absolutely down to the ground. Now, thankfully, things have come along uh, hugely since my charity was founded back in 1980. Uh, in those days, we were part of the London College of Furniture and we did a lot of pioneering work into postural support and special seating and all that kind of stuff uh, for people with disabilities. And, and, and things have, have moved on a lot. The sad thing about it is, is that, uh, and here's a shout out to all the makers in the room here, we are dealing with an enormous legacy of equipment that has been designed according to the medical model of disability. There's the second one for you. And what the medical model 
uh, looks at is actually what's wrong with people. So it looks very much at the condition and, and treats it as something that needs to be fixed. Hmm. That needs a device. Well, you can't walk very well. We'll give you a dirty, great big frame that you can clump about on and it sort of works okay and it, it helps. That's absolutely great. But it's not always the, the right solution. It focuses on too much on what people cannot do rather than what people can do, want to do, and in the way that they want to do it. That makes sense. Take the humble wheelchair. Now here's a design that hasn't really changed for about a hundred years. Interestingly enough, there have been some fabulous advances in wheelchair technology. You only have to watch the Paralympics, don't you? To see some of the fabulous designs and stuff that are out there. But for large populations and, and, and in terms of um, sort of standard issue kit, if you want to take something like this and make it really, really useful, you have to put into it a massive degree of customization. If you want a device that is actually an extension of the person that is using it, so that it is actually a help and not a hindrance, that it actually augments the individual rather than disables them, you really, really have to look at how that person uses it and how they interact with the world. Now, unfortunately, we're in a system that is squeezed for funding, we have commercial organizations that are desperate to make profit. And even though the numbers seem very, very large, actually, we're talking about quite a niche market here. So a lot of the things are not commercially viable unless you charge an absolute fortune for this kind of kit. What is really needed is a much more holistic approach to equipment design. Now it doesn't matter whether you're a young girl with hemiplegia, um, that's somebody that can only use one arm, one side of their body is usually dysfunctional, who really loves to play music. How do you play a trumpet one-handed? Or you may have cerebral palsy. How do you go skiing? You may be an artist who has an enormous amount of talent but you depend on a helper to hold a canvas for you in all kinds of positions because you have um, limited mobility. Your helper is going to get a lot more tired than you are much more quickly. How do you do that? Over the years we've created solutions for all these. Fully articulating easels. Stands for trumpets that you can assemble, put together and one-handed and then carry on playing so that you can do it properly. Frames for young adults to be able to, to experience skiing for the first time so that they can actually do everything that a, a non-disabled skier can do uh, but using the capabilities that they have. Now the thing is, is that when you actually bespoke anything like this, anybody here, I'm sure somebody here has had a, a, a suit made or a wedding dress or a, anybody had a bespoke kitchen made? They cost an arm and a leg. Now, people with disabilities are actually uh, hit by a double whammy here. We know that uh, it costs a lot of money to bespoke anything. This is my only graph, I promise you. I do love graphs, but this is my only one today. Daily living costs are a quarter more than they are for households without uh, a disabled person in, in them. And at the same time, the average household income is a quarter less. If you have a disabled person in, in a household or you are disabled yourself, you are twice as likely to be officially in income poverty. It's not all doom and gloom though. The good news is we live in auspicious times. I'm absolutely delighted that there are makers in the, uh, uh, in the audience today. There are three great forces coming together right now. The first of these is a massive resurgence of interest in craft and making across whole communities. The second one is the exciting developments within digital fabrication that puts bespoke design and manufacture within the hands of absolutely everybody. And the third is the whole philosophy of open sourcing. This is where you create something of value and you share it openly. Now, 
most of the organizations and, and the people that actually work in the areas that we do are voluntary organizations or, um, you know, we're, 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 we're charities and so on. Uh, we tend to get a bit parochial. I think we've already talked about it a little bit today. We tend to keep things very much to ourselves. We made this. And at demand, um, we are harnessing the new technologies to be able to create all kinds of, um, of devices that can be openly shared. You're having trouble turning the taps? Download one of these and print one. Having trouble drinking? A little straw holder, 3D printed in about half an hour will do the trick for you. Or if you've got really more complex needs, pop over to the guys at Open Bionics and get yourself a tailor-made hand. We really want to open up the world of, of open sourcing in this environment. We want the creatives of this world who have something to offer to be able to become a part of a community that solves problems and shares their solutions openly. We've created a platform which is called Cracktit. Find it under www.cracktit.org. Please, and I'm reaching out to the makers here, there's a warm invitation for everybody to get involved. If you've got a problem that you need solving, get on there and, and post it. If you've got a solution, get on there and make it. It's really important. And we want this community to be global. So that even small communities with limited resources, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Guernsey or you're in Bangladesh or you're in Sri Lanka or Australia or wherever, it really, really doesn't matter. You should be able to access fantastic solutions that can be designed for you and made for you at the point of need. It's a paradigm shift in the way that we deal with design for disability. So remember, it is in our, all our hands to be able to remove the barriers of exclusion, um, lack of opportunity, and stopping people reaching their potential. So I ask today, and especially given that we're talking about making here, is reach out to the makers, support them, find them, challenge them. We can make an absolute difference. One person at a time, share our knowledge, and we can help so many more people. Let's go help some starfish. Thank you.